For as long as television has been a thing, the opportunity to bring a popular animated cartoon into the real world through a live action movie that would make a ton of money for little effort was only a few textbooks excluded. I'm even surprised there are times when it's excluded, given the fact that Hollywood would turn anything to a movie for the big screen if it knew it would turn up a huge profit, make the pockets of the devil, I mean executives, deeper and with more money falling from their wallets as they waddle away like penguins. Even though I generally think that in the majority, they are just how I described them 10 seconds ago, there are occasions when I think the directors did their homework and kept the movies grounded to the way their animated counterparts and made the movie feel like it was conceived and with a purpose other than for it to be a box office success. For example, the Garfield ones or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and how could anyone forget the classic Christmas special How the Grinch Stole Christmas? But nowadays they took a turn even for the worse, like the Death Note one or the Little Mermaid and don't even get me started on the stuff that I've heard about the Snow White one. At that point, it's not even the same story. Walt Disney is literally turning in his grave. The only thing that I really liked in the last couple of years has been the Barbie one. I like where they took the characters and the overall story, it builds fantastically well on the premise of a kid's toy doll. This yapping session about live actions has been going on for too long. Basically, I'm a big live action fan, I like seeing my favorite characters be brought to life, so today we're going to take a look at my favorite childhood live action classics, the two Scooby Doo movies from 2002 and 2004. So let's get into them. A bit of background first, this movie was directed by Roger Gosnell, who worked before on films like Home Alone 3 and Big Mama's House and the screenplay was done by James Gunn. We all know nowadays for the Fantastic Guardians of the Galaxy movies. This movie has an overall feel like it was originally meant for it to be more mature than it actually is. And that actually was the case initially. Those feelings were also accented by the actor's responses in interviews and Matthew Lillard's responses when he did an AMA Reddit post in which he said that the monsters were initially supposed to be, and I quote, really scary. They were softened. A couple of years later, around 2017, James Gunn revealed to the public in a Facebook post that the movie was originally rated R. But he wouldn't have deeper, he just threw the audience a small bone and left us to chew on it. Time passes by and we get an incredible interview in March of last year. The interview was with Kent Beda, the editor for both the Scooby movies. He touched upon the subject and said that in a test audience in 2001, many parents were not happy with the project. Some people took offense to the words demon and soul and the whole premise of demons from outer space collecting the souls of students as if they were Pokemon, so they got them changed to creature and protoplasm and had to reshoot a bunch of scenes because of that. Shaggy was supposed to be a stoner, big shock, like we didn't have enough clues already. The van with the Real, whilst past the Duchy plate, the girl he was interested in being named Mary Jane and him saying that his favorite name, yeah, yeah, we, we cut that idea. There was also a different scene which wound up being completely cut off. It shows Scooby and Shake with a sign that said pot for five bucks, but they painted it with flower pots, even I think that's a bit too much on the nose. Another thing that there was a problem with was that there was too much cleavage in the film, which had to be digitally covered, I think. Either that or they reshot some scenes, can't remember exactly. Still, while well, Velma had a crush on Daphne, and because of it, she sang a whole song for her. We'll get to that when we reach that part in the movie, because some of these delicious deleted scenes can be found on YouTube and I'll integrate them into the breakdown of the movie in order of appearance. You're welcome. Another wild one was that Daphne and Fred shared the room and after a bit of time talking about monsters and stuff I guess, Daphne revealed she was faking being scared and that it wasn't the only thing she faked. Absolutely mental. The last of which I remember is one where Fred responds to Mr. Bean's comment about the kids seeming possessed with the only possession these kids need to worry about is when they go back through customs. Like what? All of these scenes, besides the one with Velma singing for Daphne, are nowhere to be found. Probably didn't even bother finishing editing because why would they? It was clear they would make the cinematic cut, but it would have been an absolute blessing in a home DVD release. But now, let's get into the actual film. And what better way to start off, if not for with a deleted scene. There was a whole 2 minute long intro that would play before we get shown the Luna Ghost case unraveling. It would also be animated and act kind of like a transition from the animated world to live action. It also featured the lengthier version of the track Shaggy Where Are You by the rapper Shaggy, which I think is an underrated classic. The whole sequence plays out smoothly, it's a nice vibe, but apparently it had been cut out for pacing issues and because if Ronald already knows Scooby Doo, it wouldn't have made sense for it to be kept. Still, I don't think it would have done any harm and come on, it's only 2 minutes, it wouldn't have been a problem in my opinion. From this we start with the actual cinematic cut, one of the most iconic scenes of the whole movie and an incredible way to start this film, showing us the gang solving a case as they usually do with the traps not working, a gang member being kidnapped and the chase scene between Scooby, Shaggy and the master. And what a master! Huge props for the people that came up with it. The Luna Ghost is such an iconic villain for the franchise, just for the design. It's ironically one of the first ones that pop into my head when I think of iconic Scooby villains. It's amongst the likes of the Black Knight Ghost and the Creeper for me. It's probably also helped by the fact that it's the first live action master we've seen, but still, the whole design with the face mask and flame abilities, such a hit. Huge, huge fan. The Luna Ghost comes bursting through the window with a laugh that's very reminiscent of Spooky Space Cooks 1 and carrying Daphne, played by Sarah Michelle Gellar, the one and only Vampire Slayer. We also get to look at Fred and Velma, played by Linda Cardellini and Freddy Prince Jr. 
and a Shaggy played by Math Leader when the Luna <laughs> Ghost said Scooby stands a flame. Scooby being played by a tennis ball, probably, or something that's not even there. I want to say this right from the get go Mary Vernu, the casting director, did an excellent job. I've never seen a casting more perfect than this one in any live action movie. It's like a fan made one that you'd see on TikTok. Everything is spot on. The best one by far being Matthew Lillard as Shaggy. He did such a fantastic job at nailing the character, especially the voice, that after the late Case Kasem departed from the role of Shaggy in the franchise, Lillard picked up the mantle and in what way? Absolutely perfect. Huge props to him. We get a couple of classic freeze frames and a good old he's right behind me and he jokes start things off. We get a chase scene that's a little over a minute long which I think is the flaw of this movie which I had the most. I don't think there is a single chase scene that last more than roughly two minutes that's one of the things that they appreciate in the franchise i felt like all chase scenes held up a couple of minutes and each time they were entertaining and having a whole last hour and a half at your disposition you could have pushed for double honestly even more like five minutes a chase scene but yeah that's that the scene captures the perfect absurdity of a normal chase scene between shaggy scooby and the monster the guys ride the skateboard through all this heavy and sharp machinery which seems a bit too wild for a toy factory but it is what it is the scene ends with the guys mistakenly bumping into the ghost therefore solving the day a perfect bingo card for a scooby intro the mystery machine comes bursting through the wall with the big star problem Anderson City behind the front wheel. We get a look into the game's famous status, something that was lacking from the animated series, but which is correctly stated in the movie. It makes sense that a bunch of teenagers would go around solving mysteries with their dog would be a sensation. The ghost is revealed to be the janitor of the factory, and he becomes this monster because Pamela refused to go on a date with him, mostly in Redditor. And apparently she owns the place, and that's why he used the ghost to scare the people from working there. We see that Fred takes the whole credit for Velma's plan when giving an interview to the media. Velma confronts the gang with this issue when they all make it outside and one after the other Velma, Daphne and Fred depart from Mr. Inc leaving all this behind them. Two years pass and Scooby and Shaggy are rolling and smoking some nice eggplant burgers. Watch fall. Hmm? Why are we still here? They get disturbed by a man knocking on the van's door. I'm surprised Shaggy kept the van. The way Fred loves the car in the animated series, it doesn't add up. The man was sent by his employer, Mr. Emil Madivarius, asking the guys to come and solve the mystery on his book island. Initially, the guys just couldn't be asked about this until the guy mentions the all you can eat buffet and the bells start ringing in their heads. Making their way through the airport, we see each member of the gang Hello there. realizing that Mr. Madivarius invited each one of them to the island. Another batch of deleted scenes shows us what Fred and the girls did in the past few years. Fred's flashback shows him going on tour with his book, Fred on Fred the many faces of me, the perfect book title for this man. In the flashback we also see an easter egg, he's got the black knight's helmet with him, as most fans know that was their first case. But unfortunately, it does not look menacing at all, I'm gonna be completely honest, it looks like shit. In Velma's one we see her in group therapy talking, and in Daphne's one we see her training in martial arts, something which will come in handy further into the movie. This is as the alternate intro were removed for pacing issues, and I can understand why these ones were. In the previous scene we found out about this spooky island, and that it houses a mystery, so we can't wait to see our beloved characters get there. Shaggy and Grandma Scooby arrive, Scooby dressed like this because large dogs aren't allowed on the plane. So tiny little questions. If Mr. Emil wanted to invite Scooby he must have known that, so he should have done something. And how the fuck did Scooby get through customs? Well, I guess if you're a different animal, it's okay. Anything except a different race. On the plane, Shaggy meets a girl with a peculiar name, that being Mary Jane, with an even more peculiar appetite for Scooby snacks, because they're vegan. Oh, so the gang spends even more money on Scooby's food than the usual. And that's why he's so fit and could run on stop. My man's primary diet consists of the 11 herbs and spices from Mother Nature. They arrive at the destination, which, first of all, hats off for the design, iconic location, and fitting vibe for Mr. Ink. It's a very promising start. They get welcomed by the one and only Miss Mandivarius, played by Ron Atkinson, aka Mr. Bean. Woo! And that's what I'm gonna call him from now on. English is not my first language guys i know shocking right because max it is like so on point i sound like any other line from a pub in birmingham i get that a lot well i might speak more coherently than them after four pints but that's a whole other story the point is i cannot see mr emil madeverius every time i talk about the man because it feels like my mouth is having heart attack and also i cannot see ron Atkinson as someone else other than mr bean maybe a bit of john english but that's about it he tells the game that the teens are acting way off after their experience on spooky island so either the realization that life comes at you fast and you'll be bloated with responsibilities and bills and everything which will make you sad so you should start acting up and be more serious about your life or something has happened to them a third part interfering as an example you have this beautiful young lady who has so much strength she manages to not throw her friend but move through the air just with her bare hands we follow this up with another you've guessed it deleted scene this one being the most important one yet i consider it shows the game going in different directions and to have made sense for the following scenes we see a shady guy buying something daphne follows him and we see shaggy together with mary jane and scooby but scooby falls off the cart and runs in a different direction we see our clueless fresher not noticing the stuff that's happening right next to him afterwards he notices some weird footsteps so he follows them and velma meeting a guy who she seems to get along with though they don't give him a name the whole movie and he makes a pretty interesting comment and you've always been a chick 
I can't believe he actually said that. The gang also serves to solve the mystery by themselves and I have to give them credit for their passion. Before watching this, even I forgot Mr. Bean offered them prize money for solving the mystery. 10,000 bucks. It's not even mentioned once again in the whole movie. They, they just don't care about that life-changing sub. How well off are these guys? Velma is not spooked at all by this dancer's performance or that bald guy's ritual because she spots all the cameras, all the angles. She'd be fucking nuts on R6. A bar gets a random call for a certain Mr. Doom. Not for Melvin Doom, but for our own Mr. Scoober. The person on the other end of the phone is clearly a mastermind manipulator. He manages to elude our smart dog so that he'd go into the dark forest all by himself telling him that there are free burgers there. I would have fallen for that too, to be honest. Free burgers? In today's economy, McDonald's is for the rich people now. A large Big Mac meal and you're not recovering financially from it for one week. As Scooby wanders off, ready to begin his pilgrimage, Shaggy wins a staff decapitated hell for Mary Jane, a gesture which melts her heart. That's all you have to do, boys. Get her a damn plush. It don't matter which type, j just get her one. He also says that he skipped French class because you don't need to learn it. Some words which melted my heart. We see Daphne ending up on the beach next to that guy's hut. He's performing a voodoo ritual with the chicken, which is the item that he bought earlier. This guy has like two interactions with the gang the whole movie and they're both funny. He goes at Daphne for wearing purple a fall color during the middle of May. You go, King. And he tells her that under no circumstances she should go to that abandoned Spook Island castle. Daphne thinks he's bluffing. He actually wants her to go, so she does, proving to him I don't have any idea what. Scooby finds the sack left by the Hamburglar, only to be confronted by an abomination which looks as if it hurts to live and breathe. The way it's designed screams, I'm in horrible pain and my suffering. So as you've guessed it, it means it's fucking brilliant and memorable. The one thing which is a bit of a throw-off is the CGI. It's clear that most of the budget for that went to Scooby, since he's main attraction, and even he has moments in which his CGI looks like shit. But I won't take any hate towards it, the year was 2002, and it still looks better than half of what Marvel puts out in today's day and age with more than twice the budget. He gets rid of the monster in a goofy Looney type of way and returns to his dear Shaxter. They both are picked by Daphne for the marvelous task of going with her into the spooky castle. The dog gets a little treat in the form of a Scooby snack and they're ready to face the horrors of this abandoned castle ride. We get inside and feast our eyes on this brilliant design. A spooky castle was already a must have for a live action Scooby Doom and the way they pulled it off was amazing. A lot of costumes and we see the bench seats of the ride with a unique model to them. A lot of hassle in the castle vibes. Out of nowhere appears Freddy, scaring the three members and also giving us a recreation of an iconic scene. He follows some weird food steps up to here, something revealed in the deleted scene from earlier. Film also comes from behind the moving costume to scare Daphne. We've got the whole gang together, so as usual they split up. Fred initially picks Daphne to go with him, but Velma has something to say about that and the fact that she always gets picked last, so Fred goes with Velma, Daphne by herself, and Scooby with Shaggy. The two hungry boys fight their way to a medieval feast, Daphne to a closed off part of the roller coaster ride, and we get a nice dialogue between Fred, Sir and Velma. I care about her swimsuit, Miles. No! Look, I'm a man of substance. Dorky chicks like you turn me on too. Followed by a uh, moving eyes in the wall sequence. They're going for 100% completion on the bingo ship. The eyes belong to a strangely dressed hobbit looking fellow, probably one of the dancers. Pulls the switch, turning on the whole roller coaster and castle, putting every member in trouble. Daphne manages to open the door using a Street Fighter combo, but gets pushed by the moving car. Shaggy and Scooby gets trapped to the wall by the food. Their biggest nightmare combined with what might be a weird fetish for these two. And Freddy and Velma get chased by a while some drinking bar that nights wield their weapons up and down, only to be followed by two goblins on a huge, I don't know what those are called, but they're sharp and coming at the two crew members fast. They search for a hidden door behind the bookshelf, but remain out of time. A blade's coming at Freddy fast, but Velma clutches the situation up by throwing him a book to brace the damage, which sends him flying. That book must have been made out of rocks, cause how the fuck does he block that? That huge spady cleaver. Freddy goes flying through the one sided mirror, accidentally turning down the lever, putting this haunted castle back to rest, saving Daphne from mere death and the boys from their foot themed sex dungeon. Daphne finds her way into an eerie looking chamber with a strange looking pyramid object placed on a pedestal in the middle of it. She barely manages to get out of the cage that starts closing in on her after picking the object up. Feels like an Indiana Jones or Minecraft 2014 trap. At this time, Fred and Velmster uncover a weird class looking room behind the one sided mirror with a brainwashing video playing. Scooby and Shaggy make their way to the set where that said the video appears to have been filmed, giving us a huge variety of art jokes. Fart jokes are lazy, but they try to make them a bit different. Matthew Lear doing a bunch of comedic movements, and can we take a second to appreciate this man's acting? He has to do all this while talking to nothing. He's talking by himself, the voices. This man is so talented. They all find each other and hide in a background costume display as the bad guys pass through the tunnels, crossing the top of my bingo shit as well. It feels like they are a team all over again, making their way back to the resort hotel. Each one is assigned a different task and they put Mr. Ink back in business. Velma starts to decipher the weird pyramid thing, which we find out is called the Daemon Ritus. She's explaining to the unnamed boy that it has something to do with an old civilization of creatures. This scene is interrupted by a flashback showing us the gang driving into the distance, waiting for the next mystery to pop up. Everyone's there. Velma, Daphne, Fred, Shaggy, and Scooby. Be. And oh, oh wait, they're scrappy too. And they made him into an obnoxious asshole that's not a puppy but a grown dog with a gland disorder. I'll always defend Scrappy. 
He is the scapegoat for the franchise's decline in the 80s. He wasn't one to blame. He brought a breath of fresh air with him in the first season of Scooby and Scrappy Doo. The franchise was already declining by that point because the same format was used for about 20 years. And when they switched to shorts with Real Masters, it was shit. The shorts were absolutely shit. It wasn't because of Scrappy, it was because of how they were written. Also, Scrappy is part of a very high fan regarded series, The 13 Ghosts of Scooby Doo. He had more of a personality than three of the members combined. I hate that I see him blamed for the downfall and portrayed like a shithead in this movie, but we move on. Scrappy marks his territory by taking a piss on Daphne, so the gang kicks him out in the middle of nowhere. We follow up with the deleted scene in which Velma sings her song, which is a cover of Can't Take My Eyes Off You. Nina Cardellini does so in a spectacular fashion. She chose the song herself and worked really hard on the choreography, and it sure feels like it. It was a beautiful scene it was cut though because right in the next one we see the monsters attack and it apparently would have been a weird shit in tone which i consider to be complete bullshit we've had plenty of times already in the franchise happy up bit scenes and then straight after we got to the monsters and it also would have made more sense for the movie because in the officially released version we go from Velma laughing at the bar to Scooby cheering out the window whilst everyone else cheers in the background Scooby gets scared and hides under the table Fred is disappointed and tells Scooby that is the most embarrassing thing he's done since he licks both at Don Knotts' Christmas party. Nice reference because the famous actor Don Knotts has appeared before in the franchise in two episodes of the New Scooby-Doo movies. Fred, as a born leader that he is, tries to calm everyone down, explaining that there are no such thing as monsters, only for one to burst through the window, catch him, and take him down with his sleep inducing breath. I like to think that the monsters don't have a special power to do that. It's just the way their breath stinks because you don't wash their teeth. Teeth. I'm, I'm dyslexic. So to a normal human it just makes him pass out. It's also helped by the fact that later on Shaggy doesn't get put to sleep by it and he's a weird fella, as we all know. Early in the movie we found out that he drinks out of the toilet bowl like Scooby. So that would be that. The dots connect themselves, you know. Velma also gets caught and put right to sleep after trying to unmask the CGI monster and finding out it's not wearing a mask, delivering us a nice jinkies. Daphne manages to take the demon right as before the bald guy, sticking her tongue out afterwards. I've always felt like that was a kid's way of flipping someone off. Mr. Bean is also kidnapped by the monsters. I guess Teddy will sleep by himself tonight. A loud Scooby Doo Where Are You shouted by Shaggy triggers a new chase scene. This one is one of my favorite tracks in the franchise, Man with the Hacks. Warner Bros. put this license to good use, cause it's not the only time we hear it. In the same year, in the episode Big Scare and the Big Easy from Us and Scooby Doo, one of my favorites, the song is also played there during a chase scene. It's roughly 2 minutes long, and as I previously stated, it's just a couple of goops and giggles. We also get a reference to how every time Scooby was chased, it stopped to eat food. Another one for y'all being of fanatics. It ends with Shaggy, Mary Jane, Scooby, and Daphne hiding in some decorated ceramic pots, it seems, as monsters drag away their friends and other civilians. They actually do the smart thing and call the Coastal Guard and wait for them on the beach. One thing they don't know is that the Coastal Guard is on the whole scheme as well, as we see them evilly laughing after hanging up the phone on Daphne. They wake up in the morning and see that everything is too normal, the resort's smashed windows have also been replaced and everyone's acting like nothing happened last night. They split up to go looking for clues, Shaggy and Scooby run into Fred talking with his male buds about some biatch and shit towards Demon and Soul didn't make it in, but I guess biatch is alright. Fair is fair. Fred reveals he has stone slightest, so Scooby and Shaggy run away. Just as we run away to the delete scenes video, because that's what's coming up next. A scene in which Daphne ends up in the girl's locker room while searching for clues. In this scene, we see Velma dancing around in the locker room before scaring Daphne into leaving and resuming to the theatrical cut, where she's captured by that large wrestle fellow, who also steals the demon writers from her. This scene would have made so much sense because we wouldn't have cut from Shaggy and Scooby running straight to Daphne getting out of the locker room without showing us what happened. It was cut for the stupidest reason, again, stupid. because of the test screening. Some parents were offended and felt that it was an appropriate scene because they thought the girls were dancing in their underwear, not in their bathing suits, and Lida did again such an amazing job. It's the second scene that got cut out like that. The boys get cornered in a mini shack slash garage with seemingly no way to escape until Scooby uncovers two motorbikes. They take off and pick up Mary Jane along the way. One hit to the head by a branch next and Scooby sees that she's possessed by what appears to be one of the creatures. Shakespeare and his dog get into an argument when he doesn't believe his lifelong companion over a girl he just met. This is probably the most real scene in the whole movie. Scooby falls down when a hidden trap opens from below him and Shaggy jumps after him. Head first. This man's balls are made out of pure steel. How they go head first on those park slides, and my man does it in a hidden entrance tight tunnel on an island with soul stealing creatures. When you're dumb, you're courageous. We get our second to last deleted scene right now when Shaggy arrives in a weird looking cave with a spectacular design. The ceiling looks out of this world, and that soul pot has an amazing design. The deleted scene shows us Shaggy watching from the distance as that clone machine takes out Daphne's soul, I mean protoplasm, and how one of those monsters inhabits and possesses her. This scene would have shifted the tone a lot and would have been a very memorable one, going for more of a dramatic approach. Also, Mr. Lillard did a fantastic job of portraying the absolute fear and dread some would have on their face in that moment. It was unfortunately cut because it would have been too intense for the younger audiences and I can understand that. 
but that's also why a more mature cut, not necessarily R, would have been better. This would have given the crew more of a wiggle room in making the movie scarier and feel like more things were at stake for the mystery solving game. Resuming the theatrical cut, Shakespeare goes and picks up his friend's souls from the pot, popping them off to return to their bodies. First one to do so is Velma, and when she gets back control of her body, the monster comes out of her and explodes in particles when exposed to the sunlight. In the process, revealing to us why the monsters had to inhabit human bodies, use them as an umbrella from the sun so they won't explode, also explaining why they attacked at night. The next one is Fred, but he barely misses his human form when the door gets shot right in his face, or better said, head. He pulls out a random stranger, but he puts him back in. Shaggy has a straight mission, and he's not there to deal with other casualties. Lastly, he pulls the red head out and sends her flying. The must spots a floating spirit coming out from behind her, and she sees the control Daphne in front. She pushes her into the room next to them so that the protoplasm can take back control and pulls down the blinders to transform the monster into sparkles. It's then revealed that Freddy was the floating head, not Daphne, and when they fight each other in the forest, a bit friend, but I guess the mystery tingle senses are real, it's revealed that Daphne took control of Fred's body. Shaggy places down the demon writers he managed to steal from the ritual point, proving once again the clutch MVP that he can be. They would have all been gone forever, if not for Shaxter. There begins a process of soul swapping until every single one is in their home. I like how all the actors managed to perfectly adapt to the roles they had to be, Fred and Shaggy as Daphne, Shaggy also as Velma, Velma as Fred and Shaggy and so on. They spot an explosion on the beach and go to see what happened. It's the random guy from the market, probably the only person left that hasn't turned yet, maybe because of all his voodoo shit. Actually, right at that moment, he was performing a voodoo spell, but he set off an explosion. It's revealed that the monsters want to take control of the whole world, but in order to do so, besides all those spirits, they need a pure one. But it doesn't have to be a human one, which means, yep. Mr. Scubert. Somewhere between these last couple of scenes, there have been our last deleted scene. It shows how Scoopy trapped in that pyramid that Daphne almost got caught in earlier, trying to fake heart attacks so that the guard would let him out. This is probably the scene with which I agree the most when it comes to its removal. The game was just explaining why the monsters need souls and stuff, and putting all the pieces together in a scene like that with goofs and shits would have fucked up with the pacing and vibe way too much. We're now revealed that the big bad guy behind all of this is Mr. Bean. He estranged Scooby from his friends so that he'd be vulnerable and feel like he only could trust him. After all, he gave him Scooby Snacks, talked nicely and took care of him. I told you he's a mastermind manipulator right from the start. Shake gives an empowering speech about Tim Morgan friendship, it's a Scooby Snack and reunites the gig together for good. We get the montage sequence of Mr. Ink setting up a trap for a beloved British fool. They plan to tip over the whole ball of souls so that they come back in everyone's body, then Daphne will open the vent in the ceiling and position the disco ball skull under it so that the light would reflect into it and kill all the monsters when they come out of their human hosts. Well thought out plan, very nice. The ritual is about to begin so they go fast about this, but unfortunately, when Shaggy ties up his part of the rope to the ball, he accidentally manages to get himself tied up together. So when Velma and Freddy jump so that the ball would get pulled up and spilled, they instead pull up Shaggy, who takes a serious fucking hit to the ceiling. Like, holy shit, how can he walk after that? The hit also causing Daphne's support to be chipped off and fall as well. While flying around like a Dutchman, he intersects with a ritual guard, knocking him out in the process. He notices Scooby getting treated as if he's Julius Caesar, so he switches off to the knocked out guard as if he's Agent 47. Doing this, he manages to blend in and stay close to Scooby. In the meantime, Velma and Fred have no escape option, so they try to play along the ritual's dance. Fortunately, Daphne was still somewhat stable on the wall, so she managed to climb out in order to put her part of the plan in order. Fraser and Velmstone get caught, who'd have guessed those dance moves, I know. Shaggy manages to say his apologies to his canine companion with some truly moving words and restore their brother like one. It unfortunately was a bit too late. Right as they finish the claw, sucks could be spurt plasma out and Mr. Bean begins the ritual. Or Lanky Stoner comes to the rescue again, latching onto the claw device, knocking over Mr. Bean in the process, disrupting the ritual. The guards get distracted by Scooby's protoplasmic head, giving Fred and Velma the chance to go and get the demon right. Scooby gets back into his body after bumping around a bit more. Upon reaching Mr. Bean's body, despite the fact that he's wearing a mask, Freddy goes to pull it off, revealing that he's actually a robot. And by chest burst, we are revealed that the person controlling this machine and the one who was behind this whole scheme is... Scrappy dude. It was only in an earlier scene that Mr. Bean scratched his neck in a dog-like fashion, but besides that, there weren't any particular clues. It was an awesome reveal. At first, you might have thought it was Scrappy given the fact that we got that flashback, but after seeing Mr. Bean as the grand villain in a robot and everything, you probably forgot about Scrappy didn't actually think he was controlling a robot. Scrappy absorbs the demon writers, which, even if not at full power, still proved to be dangerous by turning Scrappy into a huge monster with a beer gut. Daphne makes her way to the top and starts pulling the lever to unlock the vent, but she gets stopped by the wrestler. A remixed version of Scooby-Doo Where Are You starts playing, the link to us, this is the grand finale, the post fight if you will. Scooby and Shaggy are chased by Mr. Poppy Power, Daphne's fighting off El Matador, and Velma gets caught by one of the guards, but Fred is there to the rescue, using the climbing gear as some sort of nunchucks, rope dart, something that was foreshadowed in the first scene, right back at the toy factory. The two boys hide from Scrappy under the ritual site, but they get caught by the possessed Mary Jane, but slightest breath isn't enough to put Shaggy to sleep, I'm afraid. She gives Scooby to Scrappy, but Daphne manages to defeat the wrestler in time, sending him flying out of the vent, right on the side of the ball, knocking it over. One question though, how did those spikes on the ball not pierce through my men? You've from such a great height and you can't tell me that ball is not made out of metal or something. I don't get it. 
Well, they manage to pull off the plan. Daphne places the skull into the middle of the life source, causing all the monsters to pop, and Freddy uses his newly discovered ninja turtle skills to knock out the bald man. Shaggy uses the claw to suck out Scrappy's soul till he's finished and left to his old gland disorder self. We get a couple of hugs and kisses, and the movie ends with our favorite Mr. Solving Yang back together. Scrappy was also probably euthanized. Oh, and one more thing, they found the original Mr. Bean, who was apparently kept locked away by Scrappy for about two years. Well, I guess everyone got their happy ending, except for our gang. Because we have another mystery and CGI field movie to go through. This sequel brought back Roger Gustin and James Gunn as director and writer. This one, though, has a hard focus on the kid aspect of the franchise, emphasizing more of a fun, lighthearted adventure than the previous installment. It has more colorful monsters and humorous scenes for kids, removing even the slight bits of adult jokes that were left in the original after all the cuts. You can see the differences day and night, especially more if you watch them back to back. Maybe they did from the start in a kid friendly way so they wouldn't have so many changes and inconveniences caused by the test screenings. Maybe they thought that after the first movie successful, box office launch, appearing to a wider kid audience with its style would make even more money. It made about a hundred million less, but still more than double its budget. It also has a high emphasis on nostalgia and the popular monster from the franchise. This movie also features a couple of deleted scenes, like the previous one, one which I adore a lot, and it's so unfortunate that it was cut. There are also a couple of ones showing different monsters that didn't make the roster for the film inclusion. So let's start the breakdown. The movie starts with the pterodactyl ghost, a pretty forgotten monster, but because of this movie, I assume it got way more popular. It scatters around the city before going into a sewer train right in front of the newly opened mystery ink exhibit at the Colzonian Criminology Museum. The exhibit features a ton of costumes of classic monsters, and it's such a pleasure to see them in live action, even if not all of them get the chance of being important to the movie's plot or brought to life. We get our first look at the reprising actors as they come out of their limo with a Burger King sponsorship deal in their head. Every member sees their families cheering for them. Daphne's are Discord mods. Velma's are the recon cancellation squad on Twitter. Shaggy's are stoners and Scooby's are just plain dogs. If it would have taken place nowadays, there would be a ton of furries cheering for him. The first of the two huge faces that came to do a bit of guest starring in this movie is Alicia Silverstone. She takes the role of Heather Jasper Howard, a news reporter. Freddy gives a tour to the news reporter saying that they were happy to donate the costumes from the folks they caught over the years to the museum. I've already said this before, but it generally is such a pleasant sight and impressive thing. The way they made all of these costumes for this movie, given the fact that more than half of them don't even show up as masters, shows another level of dedication. I suggest to pause during these scenes when you're watching the movie for yourselves so that you can appreciate Damn, the work that went into this even more. Shaggy and Scooby stumble upon the pterodactyl ghost custom, which looks a bit different from how he did a couple of scenes ago, but I guess it's just because we got closer. Oh, and also, it blinked. Highly mechanical costume designed by that man. Props to him. Fred tries to say something to Velma, but she's too discombobulated by the presence of our second guest star, one and only Seth Green. Yes! We got Chris Griffin in a Scooby-Doo movie. Family guy straight into the tags of this video. Bro acted as if he slipped on a banana peel. Goofy ass motherfucker. He's the owner of the museum and he pulls out the nerd emojis on our gang member. It initially works until the word date is thrown into the mix and then Velma gets nervous and refuses our sweet boy Chris. He was a nice guy, Velma. Not too many of those left, you know. Chris was so upset about the rejection that he even forgot to pay the electricity bill since all of the lights went out at the museum. The huge window shutters and some strange looking green fog appears from the pterodactyl's costume exhibit. It's alive. Ned, the cameraman, gets left behind so that he can film all of this. After seeing how much John I paid Peter for the Spider-Man photos, I completely understand the hustle, my man. Mystery Inc. cooks up a fast plan in order to neutralize the threat. They catch the flying bird in the curtains, but it's to no use. Scooby and Shaggy get dragged around the whole hall and table, destroying all those fantastic meals. The other members of the gang make a comment that they have to save Shaggy and Scooby, as they usually do. Well, they were the ones to save your ass last movie, so sit down a bit. I'll not tolerate that kind of talk towards my sweet Shaxter. The main villain of the movie appears at the top of the shattered window to give us the usual evil villain yapping session. The pterodactyl ghost escapes with him and two customs from the museum. The one of the Black Knight ghosts and the 10,000 volts ghost. Why are they all called ghosts? Velma finds out that under the pterodactyl's podium there was a secret hatch that the ghost used to get into the museum. So much sentience for a lab designed monster. Frankenstein could never. Some type of weird looking scale was left behind by our UFO ass looking friends or Kowalski type of Chick takes it in for analysis. Daphne advises Fredster to not answer the questions of the hungry media sharks, but her foolish good looking believes that the press loves them, so he does that either way. They took what he said out of context, no surprise there, and they ac accentuated the fact that Scooby and Shaggy are goofballs and troublemakers. The two boys want to change their ways, so they swear to each other to be fantastic and spectacular and to take this whole mystery spiel that pays their living finally seriously. Props to them. The first change is appearance. Of course, Scooby sports a combination of Daphne and Velma's look and Shaggy goes for a shaggy fight version of Fred. They try to make a list of suspects. The first one they take a look at is the man behind the pterodactyl ghost, Dr. Jonathan Jacobo, who used the ghost and cast him to sell money in order to fund his monster-making experiments. But our aerial friend could have been the one behind this whole scheme because he died a couple of years back when he tried to escape the prison in a makeshift wing glider. But his cellmate was released two months ago, Jeremiah Wickles, one and only Black Knight ghost. 
so our game goes to pay him a visit. My man Wickles has the most anti-social doorbell ever and I love it. If you ring once, you get warned. If you ring twice, the trap door opens from below you and sends you sliding into a metal ball by your sock till he comes to to lose after a couple of hours. Daphne uses her makeup kit to activate the recognition pretty scanner to unlock themselves from the hamster ball nightmare. Shaggy takes the initiative and steals Freddy's thunder, being the one to tell the gang to split up and search for clues. The two boys go searching in the direction of a deleted scene, which shows them fooling around a bit in the hallway until resuming to the theatrical cut where we get a bit of a comedic moment. Scooby has a secret label safe in front of him, but he goes for the glasses above it instead. Then they repeat the same joke. The gang finds an old book that has instructions on the monster making process. Scooby and Shaggy find a clue about an old bar where a lot of bad guys go to, they by their finding, but they're quickly interrupted by a menacing laugh. The boys jump scared, Scooby accidentally doing it in the arms of the owner of said laugh, the revitalized Black Knight Ghost. They run and begin a comic classic scene, barricading a door behind them with everything they can get, just for the knight to come inside a different door and also help them barricade before they notice him. The brave Fredster comes in to the rescue but gets knocked out, the knight is twice his size to be fair. Daphne begins fighting our medieval bad guy until Velma finds his weakness in the book, they put it into practice, very funny. The Black Knight gets left behind as the gang escapes the manor. They arrive back at their headquarters which look very interesting, I haven't touched upon this earlier but I feel like we get a better look at it now. The TV is missing by the way, one mystery at the time though. I like the atmosphere it gives, I would have gone for something like this if I had to make the headquarters of the mystery gang, but I like the approach to it. Those vines or whatever those are on the ceiling are great, it has an overall kid friendly aspect. All the colors and the way it's shaped, it looks like a Disney Channel or Nickelodeon type of room for their TV series. The two guys want to prove to the gang that they are valuable members by solving the mystery by themselves, so they lie in order to get out of the house without being further questioned. The analysis of the scale comes back, showing that it contains Frandemonium, which as the book states, is the key ingredient in creating monsters. They pick up a new lead when they put two and two together and realize that Randemonium can be found in the mines and there is an old and abandoned mining town in Old Coosville. Then also momentum is torn to shreds though when she spots Chris knocking at the front door. Fred invites him in and she chats him a bit until Daphne has time to give Velma a pep talk and a bit of makeover. The trio with Chris heads for the mystery event right as we head towards the best deleted scene which is the most unfortunate one to be cut because it's absolutely amazing. It shows us the 10,000 volt ghost and the black knight take all the other costumes from the museum right as the two night guards have a bit of a dance off. It's also was the 10,000 volt ghost introduction. It's a generally impressive scene which showcases even more iconic costumes. The reason for its removal is that they've been away from Shaggy and Scooby and the investigation for far too long so they had to get back to it quickly and the scene which lasted a couple of minutes would have been bad for the pacing. It's even worse when you look at it and realize it was done, like the VFX and everything. Usually in deleted scenes as we've previously seen they don't look done at all. Scooby is still only a work in progress but this one looks wrapped up and finished so it was a late decision to cut it unfortunately. We get back to the hungry duo as they arrive at the fog ghost. They dress in some groovy outfits and bursts through the front door to deliver us another deleted scene. It isn't something very long, just a bit of conversation between Shaggy and his disguise and a couple of people. It was cut for the same reason as the robbery one. They had to get back faster on track to solve the mystery, so they had to get the boys quicker to old man Wickles who was sitting at the bar. He gives a couple of uh, moving words about how the crime industry is nothing to be admired and to get out of it as soon as you can, right before going crazy like the old cook that he is. Shaggy goes for a piss and leaves Scooby alone for two minutes and he gets into a dance sequence with like half the club. Scooby's wig pops off while he's dancing so they run away through the dumpster shoot. Horrible. I don't know why but the dumpster behind a club full of criminals sounds way more disgusting than a normal dumpster. The other members arrive at the museum to discover the robbery. Chris is in shambles and goes away to start his joker arc. Freddy gives the media new material to make the gang look like shit, this time though by mistake. Daphne goes to confront Heather about her wrongdoings and about how she considers her a suspect. Right as those words leave the redhead's mouth, the masked figure appears behind them on the top of the museum. Damn, they, they just can't stop catching girls at the moment. We turn our attention back to the schizophrenic Chris as he's in the back alley behind the fog ghost, questioning random criminals. Scooby and Shaggy get spooked while running into him. They have a pretty interesting conversation which gets put to rest when the guys see the old man leaving the club. They follow him to the old mining company while hiding in Fortnite bushes. They scoop around the place before being interrupted by the revitalized version of the skeleton ghost. It was done so in a classic way of going from dark to light through the shadows. Scooby accidentally triggers a lever to a secret entrance, revealing an elevator which they hop into. The other half of the gang arrives at the same mining town. They burst in on old man Wickles, thinking he was up to some mischievous planning, but he was just showing some investors model over what was supposed to be theme park he thought of and the gang made the investors walk away they really ruined his life twice. Impressive. Shakespeare and Scooby reach a secret underground lab, giving us a memorable scene of them mixing potions, becoming aliens, other franchise characters, buff Chad's hot chicks, Albert Einstein, buff Shaggy causes an explosion right before Albert Scooby turns them both back to their normal selves. The rest hear their explosion and run down to the underground lab as well, reuniting the plus together. They're disappointed that the two guys lied to them, but it was overshadowed by the huge vault that had been opened by Shaggy's explosion, the vault revealing a room called the Monster Hive. Mr. Inc. goes inside and sees this huge machinery with all the costumes put up on racks, film 
of pieces stuff together the fact that Chris is the villain because someone must have already had the pterodactyl ghost costume in the first place and he's the owner of the museum and that's why he wanted to go out with her in order to find out what they knew god overthinking is such a bitch Shaggy says that they saw him acting all psycho in the alleyway behind the fog ghost and Scooby mimics something as he did in the cartoons this being a deleted scene because it wasn't hugely popular with the screen test audience so decided to remove it Freddy, Velma and Daphne spot a flashing red light and follow it whilst the two other guys are hyping each other up for finding this place good for them what would they do next hmm accidentally activating the switch on the terminal releasing the control panel which they used as dj set to fool around mistakenly activating machinery turning multiple costumes into real masters well that took a turn to release four classics the zombie from which which is which captain cutler from a clue for scooby-doo minor 49er from minor own business and last but definitely not least the tar master from its self-titled episode god my favorite is brilliant in this movie they probably saw him on set like tyler durder the others come back to get probably their biggest shock ever fred is a fucking mvp in the way he goes to take the control pen and dodge all those monsters we get the introduction of the 10,000 volts ghost better said the first introduction in the theatrical cut the gang let's split up when from behind them skeletons pull off a fnaf ass type of jump scare they go after the boys giving us an enjoyable scene of all four riding down the mountain on trash can lids during the chase sequence you also get a deleted scene which showcases us a very early development of the cgi on it it's nothing important just when the skeletons get dismembered they get put together in a little skelly baby looks like that one's calendar when the whole sequence or better said mountain cliff ends the gang appears perfectly timed to catch the two guys in the van and drive off the masters are storming the town trying to get mystery ink to show themselves and give the control panel back causing havoc all over the city for the civilians but the gang has a planned location to go to they're all three house from when they were kids it gives huge vibes of the one from the scooby Doo spooky swamp game they reminisce upon times when they were mere kids having no cares in the world this giving them the energy to start the montage recalibrating the control panel scubert and shakster are left out of the said montage feeling a bit useless and shit we have another touching moment between shaggy and himself because there is no dog there we've had plenty of moments like this plattered around the movie honestly think that besides the og masters these are definitely the highest points of the film shaggy throws a stone into the lake hitting something with a rather metallic sound oh shit it's the captain good thing they stayed outside to guard the place they announce the news to the gang and they leave their hiding place not before launching our ghost body to send their regards to davy jones mr ink gets attacked by the pterodactyl but scooby's inner lewis hamilton comes out to send the ghost into a panel the crew arrives at the old mining place fred is left to fight the black knight in a one-on-one -on -one type of medieval dispute definitely takes the 10,000 volt ghost and velma the two skeletons leaving shaggy and scooby to be the ones to get the panel into its place fred and daphne both get defeated by their villains the vault ghost and daphne flying right next to fred for them to have an emotional moment between them velma talks to the guys before going to the strike skeletons she says that she considers them brave because they act like themselves and how she always wanted to be free thinking like them in a deleted scene we see velma running away from the skeletons for a bit before she's stuck at the closed door and one skeleton uses the other as a machine gun and stormtrooper aims at velma we follow this up with the last deleted scene this one being one of the best of the whole movie Shaggy has probably the best talk with Scooby he's ever had this whole movie, saying that he loves him, that they can do this, all things like that. But it was apparently cut because the movie had enough character and there would have been too much if this was included as well. What a shit reason. Very unfortunate for this removal. Leonard's acting is amazing in this one, as usual. Right after this, a chase sequence because this could be a shaker running away from minor 49er, right before being closed in with the cotton candy glob, or better said, he was closed in with them. This monster was kind of an original for this movie, just like the Luna Ghost was for the previous one. There were three cotton candy monsters in a comic book from 1999, but that's as far as inspiration goes for this one, I presume. There were also the ones from the Mama Cass episode in the Nuscript movies, but those were green, so this sequence also showed us Freddy and Daphne defeating the two masters by connecting them one to the other it's still to electricity good thinking and you also see Velma running from the skeletons for a bit right before falling down an air duct arriving at a weird looking shrine for Jonathan Jacobo from behind her Chris appears she's spooked she has every reason to be why is my man acting so creepy like holy shit she falls down the metal grid Chris convinces her to let him help her and she falls happily she made the right choice he saved her Times two, by the way, because the pterodactyl ghost comes out of nowhere and he pushes her so that he would take him instead. Another nice guy has fallen. Daphne and Fred arrive as well, and I think it's so funny how she suggests that the best thing to do to help him right now is to connect the control panel. Like, no. If you turn the masters back to costumes whilst the pterodactyl has him at like a couple of hundred feet above the ground, you'd kill him. What the fuck? They have a minor heart attack when Velma says that she gave the panel to the guys, but they triumphantly appear right after ingesting the cavity causing monster. Unfortunately, they don't make it quite in time. Three monsters are already back at the station, including the evil mask guy. But I'm thinking, there was a monster who we've never seen interfere with the gang. 
Where might it? Oh shit, it's here. The Terra Master traps every member one by one as they play frisbee with the disc, something that was foreshadowed in the flashback earlier. Scooby becomes the last one remaining, but our old Great Dane has learned a new trick. He takes the fire extinguisher and skates on that pavement, building monstrosity, whilst the remixed version of Scooby Doo where I replace, just like he did in the previous one, finishing it off with one line in his own name. Narcissistic, but I'll give you that. He starts the panel, the monsters have their lives taken away, they at least lived for like a couple of hours. A bit of consciousness here and there showed us that it can be harmful, and why cats and dogs would rule the world if they possessed that ability. They catch the bad guy and mask him to be Heather, the reporter. She was helped by her assistant, the cameraman. That's how the monster was on the building that time. But wait, better said, he was helped, because she was just a mask and a nicely developed female voice, because she's actually Jonathan Jacobo, the third actor ghost. Well, that's a plot twist for you. Yay, Chris is alive. Wait, did my man put up a whole shrine for himself? We have a narcissistic contender for Scooby and Carty. The movie ends on a nice note, Thelma tells Chris she'd like to go out with him and they end it off by fooling around a bit. Very wholesome and with a dancing scene at the fog ghost, so everyone's turned around for the game. This scene feels like a very childish way to end it, like the end of a Disney Channel movie or a Lego video game, but it's still a great movie. But we're not finished yet, cause now we'll touch upon what would have been third movie. For this, we only got a couple of bits of information. First of all, the basic premise of the plot, according to James Gunn. The mystery gang are hired by a town in Scotland who complain they're being plagued by monsters, but we discovered throughout the film the monsters are actually the victims and Scooby and Shaggy have to come to terms with their own prejudices and narrow belief systems. The last part can go in a lot of ways. They may sound like they were racist or as they got cancelled for something. It's like a YouTube apology. It was cancelled because the previous ones were shit on by critics and fans alike and because Warner Bros. was not happy with the way they performed at the box office, even though they both were smash hits, more than doubling their budgets. Sounds like a ton of bullshit to me, but to be honest, yeah, it is what it is. I love both of these movies. And they're not perfect, they are really fucking flawed, and they aren't taken too seriously by critics or fans alike, but those are live-action movies in general. If you look at Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb, most live-action movies are harshly reviewed like that. But I don't care about those things. I like looking at these particular reviews, because I know they were left by fans of the franchise in general, because these are the ones who can properly review a live-action adaptation of the franchise they adore, in my opinion. I love how both of these tackle these beloved characters, the first one did so in a more adult way, comically and tonally speaking, which was still very soft to what they initially planned, but still, it's a great approach and I like how they build on the already established things in the franchise and character personalities. In the second one, you feel a big shift in tone, it's more kid friendly and tries to be more like its animated counterpart, and that is done amazingly as well. I feel like both of these were worked on by people who genuinely cared about what they put out and did the most they could with the rating and budgetary restrictions they had in place. The actors as well, besides the fact that they are the perfect candidates for each role, I've never seen a more perfect cast assembly for a live action movie, period. They did an astounding job, especially Mr. Lillard. Acting by himself in all of those scenes without making them feel like Scooby wasn't actually there in person is such an astonishing job to do as an actor. He deserves all the praise and even more. This is my childhood's go to movies. They are one of my all time favorites because they are comfort movies. That's why I like to rank my films. If I had the shitty day and I like to get home and put on something on TV so I'd feel better, I'd choose a Scooby Doo episode or comedy show in a heartbeat. They are light hearted and the whole problem gets solved in around 20 minutes with shits and giggles along the way. It's a perfect feel-good experience that helps you forget for a bit about your real life issues. These two movies are exactly like that, just in a movie format. I love them. This video was not a substitution for actually watching the movies. I cannot stress that enough. Go watch them yourselves and form your own opinion. I had a great time doing so and I know that if I did, so would you. This was Lord Seal. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!